Welcome everybody. Uh, today we will talk a bit about uh, data science, uh, making, making sense of uncertainty that we have in our life. And when I think about data science, I think of it as being a science that helps us to talk about, to discuss, to make sense of uncertainty in the same way that science in general helps us to make sense of the world around us. So, some of you may have seen these kind of headlines that are quite common nowadays. For example, artificial intelligence that controls nuclear fusion or medicine, for example, personalized cancer uh, treatments using machine learning methods or even articles that can be written by computers which look almost they are as good as, as if a human has written it. So, all of these headlines are, are things that in a way implicitly talk about data science and this is what we will try to discuss. Trying to go behind the scenes, behind the scenes of these headlines, see what data science is, why do we want to talk about data science, what is data science in the, in the first place and some methods of you know what exactly goes into data science, where do they get used, who uses data science, for what purpose. And that is the, the main aim of this talk. Yeah? And since I said that uh, artificial intelligence can do so many things, maybe, just maybe, a artificial intelligence wrote this talk and is in fact giving it. I do not know. Uh, you will have to decide for yourself whether that is the case or not. Okay, uh, just a small caveat, uh, I will not focus much on, for example, data science in business or engineering. But I will talk more about the actual science behind data science and that is partly because well I am at ICER, the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. So, let us focus on science. So, uh, firstly why? Why do we want to talk about data science? Uh, let, let us start with the two words data and science. So, what exactly are data? First thing data is a plural and hence I will talk of data are or data have, not data has and so on. And uh, here is a list of things that we may come across in, in various places, a list of positions of uh, and we will just go through and figure out whether each of these can be called data or, or not. And uh, in general data are observations and measurements, when they get used in data science we want to do something with it. Uh, so, for example, if you have a list of uh, daily positions of stars, typically that is used for some quantitative purposes, so it is data. A number of children, if you want to study education in India, this will be important piece of uh, data set and so that will be a useful data, uh, that will be useful data, not a data. And uh, then there are, for example, if you want to read poems, well, do you want to call that a data set? Not very clear. Of course, if you want to build a dictionary between Hindi and Sanskrit or Hindi and English, this could very well be a data set for you. Now, uh, other things, for example, uh, household items bought by people, that is clearly a data set. Uh, next thing, songs. Uh, again, songs can be used just for listening to it and enjoying the songs or you may want to study psychology, you may want to study the effect of uh, social effects of songs. In that case, again, it can become a data set if you wish. And so, it really, really depends on what you want to do with what is given to you. The piece of information, the observation or measurement that is given to you, whether to call it a data set or not depends on what you want to do with it. And this kind of uncertainty is of course uh, quite prevalent in many, many aspects of science, many, many aspects of life as well. And so, one key lesson is uncertainty is a crucial important aspect, is inherent in everything. And a source of uncertainty is complexity, which is what we will come to in a minute. The world is complex. I hope all of you can appreciate that that actually is a statement that does not need too much of explanation. But maybe I will explain a little bit about what I mean by complexity. Uh, it is chaotic, which again we will talk a bit about and uncertain as I just illustrated. Uh, so, even something as simple as a pendulum, which we know nicely moves up back and forth, that is uh, a simple boring motion, maybe boring. But if you just attach a small thing to a pendulum and make it into what is called a double pendulum, then it shows a quite a complicated chaotic motion, 
and I am not going to define chaos precisely, but it is a motion that is irregular even for a simple system as essentially two sticks hanging from each other. So, that is one example of a simple looking system that is still chaotic. Us moving on to something slightly more difficult, planets. So, planetary motion is in fact quite regular on a certain time scale. If you want to wait for a few million years, in fact it can be chaotic. Uh, that is a debate that is still ongoing. The answer is not yet, the last word has not been said. So, uh, that is one, but then if you look at on much, much, much smaller scales of if you have climate on a single planet, much smaller of course, but still it contains the atmosphere, the ocean, it has clouds and humans unfortunately, maybe fortunately, who knows and uh, plants and all these things that makes it quite complex because of interactions among all of these aspects and that is one of the examples of a complex system. Lots of things interacting with each other in a way that makes it more difficult to study and on top of it also chaotic. Uh, that occurs in many places. For example, even a single neuron is in fact chaotic and you take millions to trillions of such neurons, put them together, that is what is supposed to be in my head I guess, I am told, I have never opened it, but and uh, that is a biological network of neurons and again that is a very complex system and very, very difficult questions to answer about what exactly is the brain function, how, what is intelligence. Of course, it is very philosophically, scientifically, conceptually a very difficult question. So, to learn about all of these very different types of systems, even going from very simple to quite complex systems, what we really need are observations about this and methodology to gain knowledge about this system from these observations. And that in a nutshell is how I think about data science, what I would call my definition of data science and why we need data science is in order to gain that knowledge from the observations about these systems. Now that we have discussed a bit about uh, why we want to study data science, let us see what, what exactly is data science. And uh, usually whenever I try to think of what is something, maybe it is useful to think of what something is not. So, what is not data science? This is just an attempt, different people will have very, very different answers to this question, but an attempt is to also relate it to what exactly is science in the first place. So, important step in starting science, scientific investigation is to ask a question, identify something that you are curious about that you have not fully understood and then come up with a set of questions about that phenomena. But typically data science is not what comes up with these questions, the, the questions come from the innate human curiosity. Uh, of course, data science is useful to refine these questions. Once you have some observations, how do you refine these questions? Uh, once uh, you have a question in mind and if you have a sufficient theoretical background available to answer these type of questions, it may not necessarily be essential to capture observations, go around and look at what is happening in the world. You may be able to answer some of these questions purely based on theoretical considerations. And again, data science may not be very useful. Of course, there are theoretical data science methods that may help you answer these questions. But going beyond this, if that, that kind of phenomena is something that you need observations for, then you start collecting the appropriate data set that you hope will help you answer that question. Either you do experiments or you take observations of the world and all of this put together give you the data set that you want to now tackle. And again, typically identifying what data sets may be useful is not quite necessarily only data science related, though the methods of data science will help you design these experiments, will help you design what kind of observations to take and so on. So, once we have all these pieces together, the question of interest, the kind of observation that you want to use, that is when essentially the data science will begin. Uh, the caution at the bottom is for you to read and think about. I am not going to say anything more about it. Okay. So, then that brings us to the definition of what I will call a compact definition of data science. It is a, it is a set of methods, it is a methodology of extracting information and knowledge from data sets. So, if you just go to Wikipedia and find out about data science, this is what you will get. Uh, in fact, 
go to the web page for data science and go to the web page for statistics. Here are two pieces that I have copied from Wikipedia. Can you identify which one is which? Which one is data science? Which one is statistics? I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is where if the talk were interactive, it would have been wonderful to have a discussion. But anyway, let's go on. And, and so the first one was the definition of Wikipedia for data science and the second one was the statistics. Very, very similar, uh, both of them in a way try to understand what to do with the data set. So methods for processing, visualizing, analyzing, extracting information from data sets is what data science is concerned with and statistics in a way is also really concerned with the same type of the same type of questions uh, very very closely related fields and data science is much much more new in a way uh, i don't think that data science as a field existed more than 15 20 years ago uh, so so it is still evolving this definition will keep evolving and you will come up with many different types of answers if you talk to many different people and probably 50 years down the line there will be a well accepted compact definition of data science that everybody will be happy with not right now anyway so uh, but but in general essentially it is to do with how to extract knowledge information from data sets so there are three key ingredients uh, again this list is is uh, will change based on who you are talk to I think of three key ingredients that go into talking about data science, mathematics, statistics, and computer science. So the mathematical modeling, the analysis is extremely crucial for quantifying verifiable conclusions. So you want to be sure of what you're saying, that's where mathematics comes in. And in particular, the mathematics of uncertainty is what is called probability theory. And so statistical and probabilistic modeling, which is the second uh, key ingredient is a way to incorporate uncertainty in a mathematically precise way. And that's pretty much the only way that we know of incorporating uncertainty in a scientific mathematical fashion. The other thing that's crucial that maybe distinguishes pure only the statistics from data science as it's practiced now is the last point which is computational modeling, computer science. The data sets that are available are quite complex nowadays. We will come to examples of the data sets in maybe five minutes or so. And uh, these kind of data sets are essentially impossible to deal with by simply using pencil and paper or even slightly more you know, calculators and so on. You need uh, much larger computational modeling techniques in order to deal with data sets and that's one of the things that distinguishes data science from statistics. And so these, each of these pieces is crucial to, for, for data science. So that's one, one aspect of, of data science. Now we'll move on to how do you actually do data science? What exactly goes into data science? What tools people use? Okay, so now we will uh, hear from other people of, about their views of data science. So first, uh, Leelawati Narayakar, who works on computational biology and machine learning uh, she will talk about what, what she thinks about data science. Hi, my name is Leelavati Narlikar, and I'm a faculty member at the newly formed Department of Data Science at ISER Pune. You will notice that many places across the world are initiating such departments. Now, does that mean that this is a new area in science and technology? Well, data science combines concepts in statistics and mathematics and computing with observations or data to better understand different phenomena. So in that sense, many famous scientists several centuries ago have also been data scientists. For example, in the 17th century, Johannes Kepler came up with his three laws of planetary motion using meticulous data that was collected by his mentor, Tycho Brahe. Right? And neither of them had any idea about gravity. So Kepler fit the simplest curve that he could to explain the observations. He thought in the beginning that it would be a circle, but it wasn't. It proved to be an ellipse and it, it ended up being right. He was right, although he knew nothing about gravity. 
at that time. Similarly, in the middle of the 19th century, Mendel knew nothing about genes or DNA or genetics that we know now, but nevertheless could come up with his laws of inheritance based on data from careful crossbreeding experiments that he conducted with different strains of pea plants. Right? And, and basically after every generation, every crossbreeding, he recorded the number of plants with each trait that he was measuring. So here you can see that he was measuring the trait of the, uh, as height, whether the plants are tall or short. Right? So what's changed now? Why do we have this as a separate field at this point? Well, I think it is because of two reasons. First is the tremendous rise in data. Okay, there's lots and lots and lots of observations now. For example, you have satellites capturing Earth images every second, right? So you can imagine how much data that is. You have weather stations recording real-time temperature, humidity, rainfall, etc. So that is also a lot of data across uh, the world, right? You have these stations everywhere. Or even our web history, which is also data, okay? It is being stored and often shared with companies, whether you like it or not. And also these um, videos on YouTube, which is presumably where you're watching this, all this is data. And of course, the natural question is, come on, not everything in here is useful, right? And that is absolutely right. Uh, which brings me to the second reason why uh, data science as a field now is important. And that is because of advances in hardware technologies. So when used creatively, they can help us make sense of this often noisy data. Right? And that's where maths, statistics, and computer science, which is what I mentioned early on, come into play. I'll give you an example. So have you heard of the Human Genome Project? This was a large multi-country effort, initiated I think in the 1980s. The goal was to find the sequence of all the DNA in the human cell. This is also called a human genome, okay, all the DNA in the human cell. Now DNA is like a polymer, it is made of repeating units of A, C, G and T. Right? And our genome has about 3 billion of these characters. And the sequence of these characters, right, is what makes us human. So naturally, scientists wanted to know what the sequence was. Uh, but technology did not, and in fact, it still doesn't, let us find the full sequence in one shot. So it could only report the sequence of, sequence of smaller pieces of the DNA, and that too with some error rate, right? So, so here's what we have, little pieces of DNA that you can measure, right, sequence. And, the, and scientists now had to look at these bag of sequences and develop special computer algorithms to put together these millions of smaller pieces together like a jigsaw puzzle. So eventually after 15 years, we have these millions of smaller pieces put together and we have the human genome sequence as a result of these data science efforts. But I don't think any of the people involved at that time called themselves data scientists. They were diverse mix of computer scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, chemists, and of course, biologists. Right? So it was a collaborative effort, and a lot of science now is collaborative. Most complex problems in nature cannot be compartmentalized into physics, chemistry, or biology. And data science is by definition an interdisciplinary field right, that tries to bridge the more um, traditional sciences with computer science and mathematics. So if you would like to know more about my work or about the department, please look us up. Thank you. Aninda Goswami who works on mathematical finance, uh, stochastic processes control, uh, fields that may not seem related to data science, but uh, let's hear from him about what his views of data science are. Hello. Uh, I'd like to talk about application of data science in quantitative finance. We must recall that in the financial market, individuals invest in several different assets. Prices of many such assets evolve over time in an unpredictable manner. Often the fluctuation of the logarithm of these prices behave like the one in the animation what you can see on the screen. You can see five different realizations of the same dynamics which do not have any 
deterministic pattern. Not only for the investor's personal gain, but for the overall financial stability of the society, it is important to understand the statistical pattern hidden in the asset price data. While quantitative finance facilitates the derivation of financial strategies using the statistical pattern of the market data, the data science tools help to identify those hidden patterns. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Arna Mukherjee is a, is a chemist. He works on computational chemistry and computational biophysics, and he will tell us about uh, data science and how it is used in chemistry. Chemistry is not far behind to use data science in its own application. You know the chemistry is a subject which has application in everyday life. Now primary focus of chemistry is you know finding out new energy sources, renewable energy sources, green energy we call it and another major use of chemistry is healthcare because one has to find out new drugs and, and, and you know, drug resistance is coming up. So one has to find out new design and it has to be a drug like molecule. So in this particular applications, uh, data science has been really helpful, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. However, you can see the recent surge in the number of publications in chemistry and that is kind of commensurate with the total number of publications in AI itself that is very difficult to give a comprehensive view. This accounts of chemical research is a special topic on data science meets chemistry. There are a lot of uh, important uh, applications of data science in chemistry has been published. So therefore, and since accounts of chemical research is a frontier journal of chemistry, therefore one can understand that how uh, data science is finding its application in chemistry. You can see here, I am reading from here, the recent advances in computing power, software and algorithms as well as increases in data availability from experiment and computation have led to dramatic progress in the complexity of statistical techniques applied to chemistry. This kind of summarizes the uses of data science in chemistry. Now renewable energy, there are great demand of that, for example, remove carbon emission to convert carbon dioxide to fuel, data science has found its application. I am again reading from here, the rapid increase in global energy demand and the need to replace carbon dioxide emitting fossil fuels with renewable energy sources have driven interest in chemical storage of intermittent solar and wind energy. Also, chemists try to find out, you know, different materials that has particular property. You know, you want to find out a biodegradable polymer or you want to find out a better application in solar cells. In data science has found its application in those areas as well. Catalysis is another important thing. For example, you want to uh, convert uh, water to hydrogen and oxygen because then you know one can produce energy sources and you need a better catalyst for that. So therefore, machine learning has again found its application in catalysis and it's coming up in a big way. So another major uh, topic which of, is of my interest also is drug discovery. So drug discovery essentially is basically finding out a molecule, uh, how a molecule interacts with the receptor of our proteins or, or some other biomolecules. And that molecule has to be, you know, uh, has to have certain property. Uh, for example, uh, there is a property called adsorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion and toxicity. So those property the molecule has to satisfy and at the same time it has to be very specifically interacting with the particular receptor. So not only we have to know the structure of the receptor, we also have to know uh, the interaction between the molecule and the receptor and also we have to know whether the molecule can be drug or not. So you can see here uh, there are uh, lots of studies that are coming up in the, this particular field as well. Now to solve this challenge of receptor, uh, you know one has to find out the structure of the protein from sequence and Google's alpha full program, now it is alpha full 2, you know later version of it has been able to design a protein structures or has been able to predict protein structure from sequence itself which remained a challenge for several years. Imagine if you, if you can find out the structure of a protein from sequence then you will be able to decode a particular part of a genome which translates to protein and then you will be able to find out the structure and its functions. 
And you can see here in this particular graph there is this uh, CASP competitions where uh, people try to predict the structure uh, because already the structure will be known by experiment which will not be released and then different computer programs will try to predict the structure and you can see that how uh, Google's AlphaFold program recently has uh, really surpassed the challenge and really did much better than any other programs. And of course, two examples I'm showing here with, where uh, the experimental and uh, the computational design by data science again applications of AI and how beautifully they match. Now, synthesis is a major important aspect of chemistry and predicting whether the molecule that you have designed whether it is synthesizable or not. In effect, every molecule is synthesizable, but, but there is a cost involved and the number of steps are involved then how much yield one gets all that right. So, data science again is helping to find out the synthesizability aspect of a particular molecule which again greatly helps uh, the design of a particular drug right. And uh, interaction, let us say when, when I, I told before right that you the particular molecule has to bind to that receptor. Now, how do we apparently design that? How do we know that whether the molecule will bind or not? So, therefore, we need some energy functions or you need to predict whether the molecule will bind or not in the target. And again, the data science, you know, with the help of available protein ligand structure and, and, and uh, different sophisticated algorithm uh, with great computational power is again trying to address that problem as well. Another, another very, very interesting aspect of using of data science in chemistry is automated synthesis. So, as you can see here, uh, this is a work from uh, Cronin's group where they design something called computer. So, they uh, write programs, they synthesize actual molecules in the laboratory and test by in an automated way uh, whether the molecule has been synthesized or not. So, that, that will greatly enhance the number of synthesizable molecules and it is again test in different systems. So, text mining again is an important aspect of machine learning. You, you know that text mining uh, is used normally to understand uh, let us say uh, what people are thinking right now about the current situations and all that. People do Twitter analysis to get some sentiment analysis on certain things. Similarly, text mining has also been used to understand molecular structure in the context of biomedicine. And that will have a great implication it, and this shows that this application is comparable to human professionals. So, when one has to understand whether a particular molecule is, is useful or not in the context of a biomedicine, then a human being has to go through several papers and then find out its application right. This task can be done by text mining and that has been shown here. Basic chemistry, the theoretical chemistry which is hinges on fundamental topics like quantum chemistry, statistical mechanics etcetera. So, he, here you can see that and quantum mechanics is extremely expensive computationally. So, what this, this application tries to do is that it tries to learn the uh, interaction between atoms at the level of a uh, sophisticated quantum chemistry calculations. So, therefore, you can see that one can surpass that computational demand to carry out a calculation by using machine learning once it learns that uh, what kind of interaction it has. And therefore, this can be used further again to know about molecule receptor interactions and, and every, everywhere else right. And you can see here people are not only trying to get the interactions, but they are trying to predict the wave functions which is a fundamental thing in quantum chemistry. When you solve Schrodinger's equation, you, you try to get the wave function and that people are trying to do using neural network. Uh, and, and machine learning in general. Uh, apart from quantum mechanics, another important uh, topic of chemistry is statistical mechanics, which basically is dealing with the sampling of a particular configuration, essentially finding out the Boltzmann distributions of that particular system. For example, if you take a protein, the protein is not just one structure. At a room temperature, the protein will fluctuate between different energy states and the different structures to create a Boltzmann distribution. And what if you can actually predict it in the first place just from the data or from the noise? This paper essentially did that from the noise, from a random noise distribution of atoms, they could create this particular molecule which is the Boltzmann weighted molecules in the first place. So, if you want one has to get this particular structure, one has to run through a long molecular dynamic simulations uh, to carry out different conformational sampling to get there and 
machine learning or rather deep learning has been achieved to show that that essentially they can you know get past all that and directly get to the Boltzmann weighted sample. So, which, which means that it not only predicts energy, it also kind of predicts the entropy of the system which is kind of remarkable. So, this use in, in, in different topics of chemistry, the use of data science in different topics of chemistry will keep on growing and uh, that and that essentially will generate more data as you can see the growth has been bolstered by large freely accessible data sets and these data sets will keep on growing and that growth on in data set will again demand for more AI applications in chemistry and with that you know increase in computation, computation and power with the increase in data science I am sure that chemistry will find lot more applications in, in uh, data science. Thank you. So, after having heard a bit about uh, different applications of data science, just, just a few other, there are many, many, many different applications. So, I have just listed a few that came to my mind, but this list can really be much, much, much longer. And depending on uh, which experts you talk to, as I said, I haven't talked about engineering, I haven't talked about business, and all of these various fields where data science is getting used. But at least, for example, the fields that are represented in, in ICER contain mathematics, uh, topology, geometry, and this goes both ways. Geometric and topological ideas are useful in data science and vice versa, the data science method help build new mathematical tools and mathematical techniques and new mathematics in their process. The same thing with the medicine, public health, I said a little bit about this headlines that you we keep seeing as well as uh, fields such as particle physics, astronomy, astrophysics where data science methods are becoming significantly more useful now that we have very, very large data sets coming for example from modern telescopes or particle accelerators or field, uh, experiments from condensed matter physics and so on and so forth. So, there is a whole variety of different fields in physics that use data science and biology, ecology, uh, social sciences, biodiversity, climate change, in all of these fields data science techniques are now becoming essentially indispensable. In fact, it is so much so that it is called now sometimes a fourth paradigm of doing scientific research. So, the quiz is for you to think about what were the first three paradigms. If data science is the fourth one, what was the first and the second and the third paradigm of scientific research. Anyway, I leave it to you. So, let us just go back a little bit and talk about what is behind the kind of headlines that you keep seeing. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, which forms a huge part of data science these days. Uh, artificial intelligence essentially are neural networks, not biological now, artificial neural networks that are motivated by the biological networks. And uh, they have become particularly powerful methodology for use in data science. And two distinct reasons are that the data sets have become significantly vast and extremely large compared to even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, for example, here is an example of very recent uh, result, a recent model that used about 5 billion, sorry, 500 billion tokens, data points in order to, for train, to train it, which was completely unheard of or impossible to do even 4 years ago, 5 years ago. Uh, so, the availability of large data sets is crucial. And the second one is, if you want to handle such data sets, you need computing power. So, these powerful computational resources are crucial for making progress in data science. And that is also growing at a, at a very, very fast rate. Uh, there are many, many other tools which of course, I do not have much time to talk about, but you probably may have heard about some of these classification tasks, unsupervised or supervised learning. How this differs, for example, from learning in the human brain is itself a very, very big topic of research and, and a very exciting topic of research in fact. So, many of these tools are now being developed and, and it is not yet complete, this journey is just beginning in a way. Uh, neural networks, classification tasks, learning, uh, uh, machine learning techniques, 
So it's an exciting time to be, to be in this field because all of these are so new and developing fields with, with, with very large number of applications and that's what makes it exciting. So quickly, just an example from the kind of research that I do and this is in the context of earth sciences. Uh, so as I showed this picture earlier, earth is a complex system. It's a complex system. It's a high dimensional system because it has lots and lots and lots of parts to this system. And in addition, as I said earlier, it's a chaotic system. Small changes will make very large changes very quickly. It's unpredictable in that sense. It's dynamical. It's evolving in time. And all of these aspects, interactions among many different parts of this system combined with the chaotic and high dimensional nature is what makes this system exciting as a scientific field, but also quite challenging. And then there is that little bit of a difficulty, which is that we have just one single earth. Quite different from biology, where you have a billion, well, I'm not sure if it's a billion, but very large number of cells that you can study, for example, and so on and so forth. But that's just one earth. Uh, that's important anyway. So now we do have large amount of observational data and also computer simulation data about the earth system. This comes from satellites from last 20 to 30 or 50 years worth of computer simulations that have been used to understand complex issues such as climate change, how weather is changing or even just to how predict the weather for the next three days or five days or how to predict the monsoon say one month in advance, the total monsoon rainfall one month in advance. It is still extremely difficult question to answer and we even with this large amounts of data sets that are available, these questions remain very difficult to answer. And that is where the field that is called data simulation or uh, the topic that I study comes in. Essentially it can be called as data science for these kind of chaotic, complex, dynamical systems. As I said, what we have are complex observations or which are noisy, partial, uncertain observations about the system. The system itself is chaotic and we want to make predictions of this imperfect, in this kind of imperfect setting. The model is not perfect, the data has have a lot of, lot of uncertainties and we want to make predictions. And of course, the, the applications are in weather prediction, climate prediction what the climate will be say in 70 years time, I probably won't be around to see what the prediction is true or not. And not just these, but it, it gets used in many other fields, uh, in biological networks, in, bi in studying biology, in studying medicine, in studying industrial applications. And there are many scientific challenges which make it uh, important. As I said, complexity is one, uncertainties in such complex system is another one and the computational challenges of understanding such a high dimensional system is a third big challenge. So that's, that's one aspect of in a way data science that, that I find fascinating and that's, when, that's what I'm working on. And just some few final thoughts to wrap up. As I said, this is an exciting time to be in this field because it's essentially just a beginning. There are quite a few successes of what is called data science. For example, understanding images as I said, producing text or in general analyzing text. Well, there are also the engineering topics which I don't, didn't talk about, robotics, self-driving cars and so on and so forth. So that combines fantastic engineering uh, systems with methods from data science in order to, to make this possible. Uh, robots won't be possible without precise engineering that goes into it. Just the data science will not make it happen. Okay, so these are kind of successes, but still there is quite a bit lacking in terms of what you can understand of why these systems work so well. And that's one of the sense in which I said this is just a beginning. That we don't have the precise mathematical, theoretical terminology or framework in which to understand these, these topics. So maybe we are somewhere at the beginning of the industrial revolution where a lot of things could be done but there was no statistical physics to understand what goes behind the thermodynamics that goes to make the steam engines possible. Or maybe we are somewhere 
where Galileo was, trying to understand what exactly is science. And is data science at the similar stage? Who knows? Maybe an AI will tell after 20 years. So uh, just a word of caution, I thought this is important, so I'll put it uh, here, but I'm, I didn't talk about it. It's a completely separate talk by itself. As with any other technology, this is not just data science, as with any other technique that is potentially so powerful, we have to use it very carefully. If you don't use prudence, if you don't use a judgment and discretion that's necessary for dealing with something that's, that seems potentially extremely powerful, uh, it can have undesirable or unexpected or both consequences which we should be very, very careful about. Uh, but that's a whole different talk. We can we can discuss it at some point. Hopefully, if all of you can visit ISER, we can have a discussion about this. That would be fun. Uh, but but for now, just a word of caution. And then, on a light note, as I said, these days a machine can write text. So here it is. This is probably not such a great example of what a machine can do. The best of the artificial intelligence networks can do much better than what I did. But essentially, I gave a phrase, since I was not sure how to end this talk, dot, dot, dot. And then the gray text which you see, it's something that was produced by these two different websites which have a example of a AI sitting behind. Uh, you decide whether this is artificial intelligence or not. Uh, I wouldn't have written any of this gray text for sure. So maybe I'm a bit more intelligent than the artificial intelligence, who knows? <laughs> Okay, with that, uh, thanks a lot for your attention and this is an open invitation for all of you to come to ICER, talk to us, interact with us, maybe study with us or maybe join us as researchers. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs>